what you should be doing is living for the eternal things, not for the temporary things. That's the point. Just speaking the plain, blunt truth. Not trying to convince you. How do I share with you this, the context of what Paul is writing to Corinthians? What, how is the Holy Spirit using Paul in his letter to the Corinthians to display to us what we need to hear, as well as Paul letting the Corinthians know what they needed to hear? And I started thinking about this time when I was in high school and shortly thereafter, where I worked in this grocery store that uh, anybody ever done that as their first job? You work, in, you work as a cashier? Uh, well, I, I worked as a cashier in this grocery store, and I eventually became the assistant manager of this store. But uh, there was this, this store in this little town that I grew up in. It was the only place where you could stop to do anything in this whole town because uh, in this town I lived on Main Street, and across the street from my house was a farm. So you can imagine how much stuff there is to do in this town if Main Street is a farming district. So this little store was the place where if you were lucky, you could get a job there in high school uh, so you didn't have to go to one of the other towns to, to work. But there was this interesting moment. We had this sale, I still remember it clear as day, where there was uh, one of the managers had pointed out that in the ad this week, there was this weird sale where a bunch of stuff was buy one, get two free. And that was a big deal back then. Doesn't that sound good? Buy one, get two free? Yeah. Well, I remember working the register, and this lady comes up, and she's got two boxes of pasta, and it's buy one, get two free. And I scan one, and I scan the other, and she's furious. And she says, I thought it was buy one, get one free. And then I had to explain to her that, no, it's buy one, get two free, and you don't get the deal unless you get all three boxes. Because that's when the, the register was, it was coded, encoded, that the, it, the price would not come down until you got the third, third box. She said, well, I don't need that much pasta. I said, it's free. <laughs> Why does it matter if you need it or not? She said, well, I don't want it. Do you want the deal? She wants the deal, but she doesn't want all that comes with the deal in order to get the deal. And, and that's what I was thinking about in this moment where this is kind of the point with Paul. See, it, Paul is actually writing this letter to the Corinthians because he received a letter from the church in Corinth asking for his advice on stuff. And I bet they were waiting with anticipation. The Apostle Paul, the guy who set up our church is going to respond to the issues we're having. And then they get Paul's letter. And the first six chapters of Paul's letter have nothing to do with the things they were asking him about. <laughs> they got a whole lot more than they bargained for. Uh, they Buy one, get two pieces of advice for free from Paul. And that's exactly what's going on here. Paul is responding to this letter that he received from the church, but... Up to this point in the first six weeks of this series, we haven't even dealt with the things they asked Paul about. Paul is instead saying, yeah, I heard about you guys, and uh, well, I have some things to say uh, before I even address your questions. And so Paul is giving them more than they bargained for. In fact, in the beginning of Paul's letter, in the first six chapters, we see these major issues. There's, there's division in the church. The... the the Church of Corinth is having arguments about which minister they follow, whether they're of Paul. I was baptized by Paul, and I listened to Paul's gospel, and I was saved by Paul, and other people are saying, well, I, was from, I got saved by Cephas, or I was baptized by Peter, or I was baptized by Apollos, and I follow Apollos' teachings, and Paul responds to them, and he says, hey, guys, the division is ridiculous. You know what Apollos preaches and what Paul preaches and what Peter preaches? The gospel of Jesus Christ. You are the church of Jesus Christ. You're not the church of Paul. You're not the church of Apollos. And you're not the church of Peter. You're the church of Jesus Christ, and we all teach the same thing. And if you have an issue with one of their teachings, you have an issue with mine as well. Because it's all the same gospel. And so he says, there's no reason to divide over this. Instead, you need to listen to the whole counsel of God. And so there's that issue. Then 
Paul gets into spiritual immaturity. This church that he helped set up, he spent so much time with the Corinthians helping them get set up, and they seemed like wise people, at least knowledgeable people, and they set up this church uh, where they didn't really have a direct spiritual leader. They led by counsel, and they taught by counsel, and he recognized that they weren't growing. And he said to them, basically, you're still, le- you're still drinking milk. You need solid food. Because just like our relationship with God, it's like our growth in real life. See, Jesus said in order to be saved, you must be reborn. Your life starts anew with him. And in the beginning, maybe milk makes sense, like an infant. What you need to nourish you and to understand the gospel and to understand the things of God. But if you ever want your relationship to go deeper, you need solid food. You need to grow up at some point. And Paul tells them they need to grow up. And in you know, I guess in that effort, he gets right into adult topics and he talks about sexual immorality uh, and their, their propensity for legal strife. These people were suing each other rather than dealing with the problems at hand directly with one another and within the church. And he's saying, what are you guys doing? You're, you are telling me that you are suing one another, bringing your small disputes to the civil courts as though the world has more wisdom than the church. What kind of witness do you think you have in the city of Corinth if you're saying the world has more wisdom than the church? That's silly. And then you're proving it to the world by acting just like the world. And you're committing all of the same sexual sins and the same problems that exist in the city of Corinth that you were saved from. Stop. Get out of that. And we dealt with some of that in the previous weeks. Well, now as chapter 7 opens up, he finally says, I'm going to deal with the questions that you asked me. So this must be a nice breath of fresh air from the Corinthians because he's responding to their questions. Now, the problems in uh, in, in the city of Corinth was that it's a heavily pagan city. The city included worship of the false god Aphrodite, including a temple to Aphrodite, 1,000 prostitutes which would engage citizens and travelers in the city into the debauchery and nightlife that existed in Corinth to raise money for the temple. That was part of their worship to this false god. And that cultural way of thinking invaded the church of Corinth. And Paul has been dealing with some of that, uh, but they might not have even realized that that was part of the answer to their questions. See, it resulted in two extreme views. Because of the way that the culture existed in the city of Corinth, because there was so much sexual sin and debauchery that existed in the city of Corinth, they ultimately came up with these two extreme views, which still sort of exist today in this way. They believed, or their premise in Corinth, or their philosophy was that the body or the flesh is evil. Therefore, you could live one of two ways. And they had a divide about this. The spirit is either separate, it is separate from the body, and therefore, the body is evil. So when you indulge the body, you are not engaging your spirit. Thus, you can do whatever you want with your body. And they engaged in the same culture as the rest of Corinth. And they engaged in all the same type of immorality and sexual sin because they saw it separate as their spiritual life. And Paul is saying, no. And then the other side of this, which is what Paul is going to deal with in 1 Corinthians 7, is that there was this idea that even in marriage, the Corinthians who were saying, because the body and the flesh they believed was completely evil, that they shouldn't indulge any pleasure of the flesh at all. So even in marriage situations, there was a group in the city of Corinth who were saying we should be completely celibate even if we're married. And we shouldn't have any sexual touching at all. Um, so, fun topic, right? You guys up for, the, <laughs> up for this tonight? That's what we're talking about. Uh, so, Paul opens up the letter and he says, uh, in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 and 2, he says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So, imagine being the leaders of the church and you get to chapter 7 and Paul finally says, Now, to deal with the things you asked me about, You've been getting an earful up to this point. He says, It is good for a man not to touch a woman. 
Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Now, first of all, we need to grasp, grasp the context and the situation within the city of Corinth. They were asking a very specific question, and this is a very specific response. The city is saying, because of the way our culture is, should we resist all sexual pleasure or should we indulge all of it? And Paul says, uh, no, why are those your only two points of view? And he basically points out that the practice of restraint or celibacy is a good thing. However, because of the culture of Corinth, it is unlikely to yield good results trying to be pure. And so he says, considering the sexual temptation and practices in the city, Paul advises that everyone seek marriage, that they have their own husband and wife, um, so that they're not just surrounded by temptation all the time. Now, this is pragmatic advice. Remember, he's dealing with a specific city in a specific situation. And so San Francisco and Las Vegas have very different issues than rural Kentucky. Fair to say, right? So he's dealing with a city that's kind of like San Francisco and Las Vegas combined and saying, look, look at all the temptation around you. You should actually indulge yourself in proper biblical marriage and not have temptation around you all the time. That would be the best way to handle this. And he says, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And the point here is that context matters. He's speaking to a group who are asking if they should restrain completely from the marital bed because they're afraid that the flesh is evil and any time they indulge in pleasure, that it's bad. So what Paul is saying is in benevolent terms, in Christians who are submitting to the Holy Spirit and acting wisely, saying husbands and wives fulfill each other's needs. Fair? Great, let's move on. Uh, verses 5 through 7. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment, for I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Now the concept here is that it's good to spend time devoted solely to God. If you spend time in fasting or prayer, you might also be fasting or praying from other types of physical pleasures as well so that your mind can be solely focused on God. However, this state is temporary and you should engage with your spouse again so that you don't open yourself up to further temptation outside of marriage because you've deprived yourself for too long. Now, here's the deal about Paul. Was he married? We have no idea. There's really multiple ways that there, this is looked at. Now, it's not known whether or not Paul was married. Um, because he was a Pharisee and very likely a member of the Sanhedrin, or at the very least was in progress to achieving being a member of the Sanhedrin, the cultural norms, considerations for his position, judging matters, would have either suggested or actually required that he be married in order to be on the Sanhedrin. Uh, However, at the point Paul is writing this letter, he's clearly not married. Uh, he couldn't deal. Uh, it's very likely that some of the church tradition is that when he converted to Christianity and became zealous for Jesus, his wife might not have been able to handle it, and he let her go. It's also possible that he was married and his wife passed away, and he just decided to live as a widow. There's also some church tradition that suggests that he wasn't married, and there's also some tradition that st states that he might have been married later after he wrote the letter of Corinthians. So ultimately, the point is, we don't know. <laughs> we can just take his advice for what it states. But Paul is saying here, at this moment in his, in his life, we know for sure Paul is not married, and he says, I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Meaning what he's saying is, if you're gifted to be single and it doesn't tempt you at all, and you can live a life that is 
A, single, but also devoted fully to God. Not single and then chasing whatever you want for yourself, but single and serving God. And you can live that way. That's a gift. It's not natural state. So Paul recognizes his own state is different than the world. If you can live in that state, good for you. But if you can't, that's not a sin, even though Paul would recommend it because his life is very fulfilling, serving Jesus. He says, I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So that's vivid imagery right there. But he says, uh, he says what he says. This might lend credence to the idea that Paul maybe once was married and either lost his wife prior to, uh, lost his wife to, like she died before his conversion, or that he let her go. But the point really is here, whether you're single or a widow, there's no obligation for you to remain unmarried. And if you are able to devote your life to the service of God, that's great. But uh, because when you're single, you have freedom that you don't have if you're not. And take advantage of it for the service of God. But keep your vows. So he goes on to continue. Now to the married, addressing the married people in the crowd. He says, to the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. A husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe she is willing to live with him, let him divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, but the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. God has called us to peace. For you, for how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife. Now, that's a lot of words. What is Paul saying? Basically, he's saying, if you convert to Christianity while you're married and your spouse did not, that's not a cause for divorce. Uh, this is not, you know, to intentionally marry someone with a completely opposing worldview. It's not saying, oh, if you're a Christian, go date someone who's not, or if you're not, date someone who's a Christian and have diametrically opposing worldviews uh, that will make your life incredibly hard. What he's saying is, if two unbelievers are married and one get, converts to Christianity, that's not a reason to divorce the other. However, you know, if you're able to make it work and commit your life to Christ with an unbelieving spouse, you should do that. In fact, you might even be able to show them Christ and eventually get them to convert as well and save them and give them eternal life. However, if your conversion has caused so much strife within your home that your spouse cannot take it and they want to leave, he says, let them go. And so this also might be reference to Paul's own life. It could have been what existed with him. But if you become a believer and it causes so much strife within your home that we should seek peace, let them, let them go. If you're going to follow God and it's going to cause too much trouble within your home, then let them go. Which is not what I would have expected Paul to say, but that's what he says. You know, so let them, let them go. Don't, don't let it be a hindrance to you serving God. Uh, and actually, don't make it so hard on them. I, I think maybe the reason that he says this is, not only would it be a hindrance on you following God because of the strife within your home, but if you being a Christian causes your spouse to hate other Christians because of the strife within your home, it might not be a good witness to them. They might need the peace and, separ and separation. I don't know. But I would say Paul addresses first the children to make sure that they are safe and healthy and consider what is best for them uh, and that they should be saved and, and sanctified. Well, first is 17 through 24. As God has distributed to each one as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordained in all the churches, was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not become circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. 
Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in the state in which he was called. So ultimately, a Gentile does not have to submit to Jewish customs or ritual laws such as circumcision. A Jew doesn't have to give up his cultural heritage or customs. Your occupation doesn't have to change. Salvation does not have to change every aspect of your life. But it should change your motivations, your behavior, and it certainly changes your heart. But it doesn't mean you have to leave your family, town, or occupation. Just do what you're doing now for the Lord rather than for selfish ambitions. That's the point. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord is in, uh, in his mercy made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. Now, Paul spells things out pretty clearly, but the language might be confusing to us. But he's basically stating that the celibate life is good. If you can remain pure, do it on your own, that's a good thing if possible for you, but he recognizes earlier that that's a gift. It's not the natural state of man. So if you've been gifted with that, that's, you know, good for you. You may devote your life to the service of God without distraction or separate responsibilities. However, marriage is not a sin, and if divorced, remarrying apparently is not a sin. He says, if you're loosed from a wife, do not seek a wife, but even if you do marry, you have not sinned. He says, it might be better for you if you can remain single, but if you have gotten remarried, that's okay. However, Paul himself experienced a lot of persecution. I mean, Paul's life was filled with getting beat up, getting spit on, getting, you know, malaria, getting shipwrecked, um, getting cast out from his community, uh, getting excommunicated from the Sanhedrin and from the Pharisees. He lost his his wealth, his respect in the community, his, his everything, his whole life. And so he was warning believers of the trouble that this world has for you. He's basically saying, uh, you know, large parts of the world still, loving Christ gets you imprisoned or killed. And that is something to consider when you're thinking about what that means for your future. And so Paul lives in this world in the first century where he's experienced all of the strife that it means to be a Christian, including ultimately he gives up his life as he's beheaded in Rome because he preaches the resurrection. And he's saying Christians, and even still to this day in the world, there are places that will put you in prisons or kill you because you say that you believe in the resurrection of Christ. That still exists in this day. And so you're thinking, when you get married and you have responsibility for a husband or a wife or children, you're responsible for things in this world, yet you have a faith that can get you persecuted and that can destroy your family. And he's saying, think about the risks when you make decisions for your life. Now, we're kind of removed from that bubble here in the West. Um, Maybe we're starting to see some of that strife peek through the fog, but still for the most part, you're not going to be, you're not likely to lose your job. You're not, you're not, you're definitely not going to get gunned down. At least for the most part, you're not going to get gunned down or beheaded or anything because uh, you've decided to follow Christ for the most part in the West. But this is a real possibility in a lot of parts of the world. Uh, and it was certainly a real problem in the first century. And if prophecy is right, which I think it is, it will happen again. And so Paul is warning you, believers, really think about the risks and the responsibilities that you have in a family if you're going to take on a spouse. That's the idea behind that message. A little bit more sobering than maybe we originally thought reading this, right? But I say, brethren, verses 29 through 31, the time is short. 
so that from now on even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep, those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world as not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away. See, Paul is searching for the imminent return of Christ. And while it didn't happen in his lifetime, the warning is still clear. Live for eternity, not for temp- the temporary pleasures or comforts of this world. And so as Paul is pointing this out to these people, he's thinking, you know, with all that he's experienced, he's expecting the return of Christ any time. And he's saying, eternity is coming. We should be living for eternity, not for the comforts or pleasures of this world. And that message still stands strong. Because if it didn't happen in Paul's lifetime, we're a whole lot closer to it than he was. And eternity is on the horizon somewhere. And we should be living for that, not for the temporary pleasures of this world. But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord. He, uh, how he may please the Lord, but he who is married cares about the things of this world. How he may please his wife. There's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about things of the Lord that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of this world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. So again, Paul reminds us that the sing- in the single life there is freedom. There's That freedom is good if it's harnessed and used for the sake of the gospel. You can go around without having to check in. Basically, you don't have anyone you're responsible for, no one you have to check in with, no one you need to be concerned about or their comfort or needs. You can just go where God needs you. If you're single, you're free. Now, that freedom often comes with temptation, and a lot of people misuse it. But if you're able to use it directly for God, that's a good thing. And Paul states that, and he's, he wishes it more for people. But when married, as you, should, as you should be doing when married, you must care for your spouse and be concerned for their well-being. Check in with them. You become tied to a responsibility that limits your movement. That's not a bad thing. It's just the reality. Now, the problem here is, Paul is responding to a very specific set of circumstances within the city of Corinth. He's not talking about marriage as a whole and what, what proper marriage looks like or what the description of marriages look like. He's dealing with a particular issue with the specific temptations in the city of Corinth and the questions that they asked him. These are the answers to those questions. Paul talks further in the book of Ephesians about what marriage really looks like and the symbolism of the relationship that it has between us and Christ and uh, how we can draw closer to God and how the the symbolic uh, image of marriage and what it really means. And, And so this isn't Paul's conclusion on the matter. He's dealing with a specific set of problems. And he's saying these are the answers to the questions you've asked. And he says to the city of Corinth, if you could be single and live for God solely, that would be great. I don't expect you to. In fact, you should get married. And when you get married, you should be caring about the satisfaction of your spouse. You should take care of one another, care about them, take care of their needs. Uh, And then also when you get opportunities, take time to fast and pray and spend time solely with God, but return to caring for your spouse. This is what Paul says to them, to their problem. He says, but if any man, in uh, verse 36 through 40, if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin, if she is past the flower of youth and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin does well. So then he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment, and I think also I have the Spirit of God. So what is Paul talking about here? He's giving advice to fathers with single daughters, particularly single daughters who are Uh, still single in advanced years beyond their uh, sexual prime. And he's saying, if your daughter has a suitor, let her get married. 
if that would be good for the couple, let them get married. Uh, however, if you don't let her get married and she wants to stay single, then that's also really good, but let them get married. It's that simple. A lot of language just to say marriage is okay. <laughs> marriage is not a bad thing. Uh, but Paul, in his own state, advocates for the single life, if possible, uh, a single life in service to God. So what is the whole point of this chapter? You know, what are the takeaways? What are the things we take away? Now, the truth is, it's mature content, and sometimes the Bible is. You know, they're asking tough questions. Uh, they're thinking about this whole idea of separating the body from the spirit, uh, what's on the outside with what's on the inside, and that is still a problem today. That's kind of the philosophy behind some movements that go on today, separating the outside from the inside, the flesh from the spirit. Uh, but you can't. You can't separate your body from the spirit. Don't buy the lie. Don't engage your body in sin. It's part of you. It's part of how God created you. Your body, your spirit, your flesh, and your spirit are connected. They're all body, mind, and spirit. They're all the same. They're all part of you. Don't engage your body in sin. In fact, repent. Don't buy the lie that you can separate the two. It's not true. Marriage is also good. This is another takeaway. Marriage is good. Seek to satisfy your spouse within reason. Do not force an unbeliever to stay with a convert. And uh, it comes with responsibility that limits your time and effort. If you get married, recognize, one, consider the risks of being a Christian in this world when you get married because of the responsibilities that you have. And also recognize the limiting factor in your effort and time and movement that marriage would have on you, especially if you're called to do a whole lot like Paul was. Being single was good for him. He was able to do more because of his singleness. So marriage is good, but the single life is good, not for licentiousness. Being single gives you freedom, not licentiousness. The, the freedom to act like the city of Corinth to have the license to do the things the city of Corinth was dealing with and, and perpetuating in that sort of culture uh, was sin. Being single doesn't give you permission to sin, but being single gives you freedom to do more for God because you have more freedom of movement and less responsibility. So if you're in service to the gospel, the single life is good, but so is the married life. It's, Paul acknowledges that the single state is not a natural state, but a gift from God if it's sustainable. So if you have that gift, thank him. And he says, live for eternal things. This all boils down to this. His whole point boils down to this one idea. Whether you're single, whether you're married, the point is you can't separate your body from your spirit. Whatever you're doing, you have to use your body to do. And what you should be doing is living for the eternal things, not for the temporary things. That's the point of this whole chapter. Whether married, whether single, don't indulge in sin. Don't get caught up in the comforts of this world. Live for eternity. In fact, it echoes the words of Jesus. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the Apostle Paul willing to dive into difficult subjects and mature subjects. God, I pray that we learn from this and that we have things to apply to our lives. It's a difficult subject to talk about, but God, you're the creator of this universe. Nothing's difficult for you, and you sent the Apostle Paul to tell us about these things. I pray that we take it within our hearts and apply these things to our life and recognize truth when it's right in front of us, which is your word. God, we love you, and we thank you for, for your word. pray that it gives us strength and encouragement and hope to move forward, to serve you in the way that you've called us to, whether that's married or single, locally or nationally, or whatever the, whatever the calling is in our lives. Just help us live for eternity, not for the temporary. In Jesus' name, amen.